I wanted to ask you to come here because I don't know if you know this, but like, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but my first orchestral reading, I mean, you were one of the mentor composers for, and this was like, not to date ourselves, but this was like literally 10 years ago. I think this was back in 2013. And I have to say like that for me, jump started at least everything that I did in the last 10 years. So I have to thank you, you know, for that a lot. It's, it gave me a lot of confidence to kind of keep going doing that American Composers Orchestra reading back in 2013. Yeah, I remember you were, I remember at that time that you were really, really influenced by film music. First of all, I remember that you were very young. Yeah. You were one of the kind of younger people that, that we've had over the years, and you must have been like 21 or something. It was or, like, even, or maybe younger than that, yeah, yeah 20, 21. 20, 21. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I think of you and Carlos Simon as being two composers that, I feel like I, I, I came across right at, at this time when both of you were very interested in film composition and writing for film and TV. And then you were kind of making that transition. Well, of course, you were always studying concert music as well, but that that was a, a primary motivator and influence for you early on. Well, I don't know where Carlos Simon grew up, but like I grew up in LA. So I was like constantly surrounded by that kind of thing. And nobody in my family did anything to do, had anything to do with music at all. So like to them, orchestral music was what they heard on screen. You know, I thought the same thing too. But then when I went through the LA Phil Young Composer Fellowship Program that they started up while I was in, in high school, I was, Steve Stuckey showed us Lenos by Stravinsky. He showed us even some of his own pieces. I said, what the heck is this? <laughs> You know, this is still cinematic in a way, right? I mean, it's a lot of early Stravinsky is quite cinematic. I mean, it was in freaking Fantasia, for, for God's sake, you know. But I thought, well, this, you, he's actually doing a lot more. He's got his own voice. So that kind of got me thinking at that time that maybe there's something else out there besides just going that route. When I was doing that ACO thing, I was still thinking much along those, you know, film music lines for sure. I mean, it makes sense because in America, it's a culture that's much more about Hollywood entertainment wise than it is about anything symphonic. That's, you know, that culture comes from Europe. So even though we have our own symphony culture, but it's really adopted from that, it's a, it's a transplant from immigrants from Europe coming to New York and establishing the New York Philharmonic and the Met eventually. I mean, the story of American classical music is a, is a pretty fascinating story uh, in itself. But it makes total sense that someone growing up in America, I mean, Carlos in Atlanta, you in, in LA would gravitate toward film because, you know, it's, it's, it's such an American medium. Um, and, or it's, of course, it's not originally an American medium, but America really made it its own kind of medium. And Hollywood became such a strong kind of influence and artistic imperative in itself that, you know, that's... When, when Americans think about mass culture, we think about movies and, and TV. And so that's how a lot of us get our culture, our first exposure to culture. So it makes sense. That's a lot of people's primary place that they may have heard orchestras or chamber music. Because Hollywood was, was also always open to innovation, too. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, it's funny with uh, Carlos, actually, too, now that you mentioned that he's from Atlanta, because, I mean, now Atlanta is a huge hub for film. Also, I don't know if it was when he was growing up, but it, now it's a huge hub, Atlanta, with the Tyler Perry Studios and that kind of thing going on. A lot of people are moving over there to do film work. But I'm not sure if he's still doing film work now. I know that he does a lot of orchestral concert no. music stuff now. I don't know how much of that he's doing. I think nowadays people are coming in. I know people that do both. Like they're like they're working in both mediums like all the time, which I don't really I can't really fathom how they do it, but I think that you know, it's funny. Years ago, when I was a student, I had this opportunity to drive Penderecki around. I wrote about it on this blog. And I read it too. Yeah. <laughs> I did. You for years ago, yeah. He told me, don't write film music because it will corrupt you and it'll corrupt <laughs> your mind. You know, he had this very absolutist view about this and about the integrity of concert music. I don't necessarily think that way at all, but... I do feel that writing for film and TV, the function is different. The The basic function is, first of all, collaborative. It's to serve a director's vision. So the director can tell you very clearly what they want and don't want. And then you have to adjust to that based on what the story that they're trying to tell. With music that is more abstract, 
um, like concert music, you're seeking your own voice and you're seeking to, to put something out there that, that is more singular and has a particular point of view. And I think that what's tough about reconciling those two things, writing for a narrative form like film and a collaborative narrative form, is that tension that exists between trying to create something in your own voice and trying to create something that serves the vision of somebody else. And it's hard to reconcile that. It's hard to kind of come up with music that has an original sound, but that's being created in this kind of very collaborative way. I don't think the film composers by and large today are thinking or have much ego in, in the work themselves. And I think that's the... I think that's something that we as concert composers struggle with, at least I do. I mean, I think, I always say this, I think, <laughs> I mean, it might sound weird to you, but I think composing concert music in some ways is a, is a semi-narcissistic endeavor because we're, we're expecting to write this music that no one's ever heard, and we're also expecting them to sit there on their butts and listen to it. And if the piece is like more than like two minutes long, you know, good luck keeping their attention. And because most people, you know, they're nowadays are just scrolling, you know, you're, you're lucky to get their attention for three seconds. So I think that we as composers, it's just my opinion, you know, it's almost like a higher responsibility in a way to make sure that what we're doing is interesting for somebody else to consume. And it kind of goes back to the idea, I don't know if Penderecki has this idea, but like they, you know, they, this idea that, okay, I only write the music that I care to write, right? That I want to listen to, which is true. But I think there has to be some other consideration, and I think that's the tension that we deal with, right? Because I don't think it's completely tensionless when what we're doing versus what a film composer is doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm not sure it, it, one could call it ego. I would just say that what we do is a lot about self-expression. You know, if, if, if we're trying to think about what an artist is trying to convey through their work, then there's a directness in that self-expression that has to be clear. Yes, it needs to explore and penetrate one's own consciousness, but then it also needs to somehow be clear to whoever's perceiving it. So when we talk about you know, and, and that's tough in today's environment. You were talking about people's attention spans being three seconds. Let's say if, you know, if, if we also want to talk about the fact that people are very visually oriented, that's, that's a whole other layer of consciousness that music is telling you to ignore, you know. And in a way, it could be that in writing, I mean, I'm calling it concert music for lack of another term. Right, um, right. I guess that's what ASCAP calls it. But I like that term only because it suggests that it's for listening in a concert situation. But, you know, then again, it may, maybe it puts it in some other box. I don't know. But, you know, it also asks you to turn off the visual and just concentrate on sound. And so that's really, it is asking a lot from the audience. You know, oh, it's, it's It's taking them out of... A zone of feeling comfortable and putting them into a zone of perception now this is about perception and and try to try to turn off some of these other senses i mean turning off the visual sense is such a huge thing for audiences today to turn that off to say we're going to go into a sound world is something that people just aren't used to because you know i'm of the generation that Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm very Generation X in the sense that MTV came about when I was a kid. So we used to go, I'd go over to my friend's house who had MTV at cable. So we didn't have cable. So I went to my friend's house. We, they would, they'd be watching MTV and we'd all sit around and see this like music videos. What a crazy thing. I mean, we listened to music on the radio. We didn't have videos of music. And now all of a sudden you were watching videos. And so in comes Michael Jackson with Thriller and other stuff before that. But it was, it was like all of a sudden music was something you watched. Whereas before, when I remember, you know, when I was a little kid, music was just something you listened to, not watched. And so I saw that transformation in the same way that I saw computers come in and gradually take over more and more of everything that we do. And, you know, it has a huge effect on our consciousness and even just the way we think about the arts in general. And so when I think now about what it means to shut people off from the visual and say, just listen, that's much harder than it used to be to get people to just listen and not look. We're much, much more visually attuned than we even were when I was a kid. So I'm seeing the world change, which means I'm getting old. But, I, but when you see these changes start to happen, you say, wow, it, you know, it really wasn't like that. Sometimes it takes a minute 
to even remember that it wasn't like that at that time because things have changed so much that it's hard to remember that. It's hard to go back to that place. It's, it's funny because you, you talk about self-expression. You talk, you talk about the visual versus the audio. But when I heard this piece that you wrote for the Jack Quartet called Hustle, Hustle, it's a word that I think visually, usually. It's a word I can see, especially in, you know, in Manhattan and in New York, people hustling. You, it's a visual thing. But you somehow were able to capture it in a completely you know, oral way. So let's hear a couple minutes of this movement called Hustle. At least with this movement in particular, I didn't know what the title was as I was listening to it because I was kind of just like, uh, I think walking around the house at this point when I was uh, listening to that. I said, I need to find out what the title of this movement is. And it says Hustle. I said, that's exactly what it is. So you were able to capture at least that feeling with that piece. And I'm trying to figure out how exactly, why, why does this movement sound like hustling? Like, I don't really understand it. If I were asked to write a piece called Hustle, I don't know if I would come up with anything like that. Well, it's a good thing, I guess, I wrote the title after. Really? Okay. Do you, are you a title before kind of guy or a title after? It depends. I'm a, the last, the last orchestra thing I wrote, um, the title came out much after. But the concept was before. The title was after, but I don't know if you're a concept guy, title guy, just write the notes, figure it out later guy. It's hard to tell with the music that, that you write actually because each each piece is so actually each piece is so specific. It almost doesn't sound like it was the same guy that wrote it actually when the, the, at least the three pieces that you sent me. So I thought it was I thought it was interesting in that way. But it seems like all the pieces that you sent me they all tie in together actually conceptually in that you're trying to focus on one cultural avenue. And you just go thousand percent in that direction as much as you can. And then, okay, I'm done with that. Let me go try something else, which I think is very interesting. It's not something that people are, at least in my experience, people are kind of wanting composers to do. This idea of like, you know, explore other cultures that are not necessarily your own, but you're doing it in such a tasteful way, I think. And this piece here with, that you had for the Jack Quartet is no different. I think, you know, composers work in different ways. And for me, you know, I've often wanted to put myself in situations when I, that I wasn't particularly that comfortable because it would help me learn something usually. So traveling and learning different styles of music in the place where they originated or where they were flourishing for me was a way to, is a way to get music in its context. I mean, context has always been really important for me. It was, you know, when I was, say, in West Africa, 
in Ghana studying the xylophone. It was important to me that the, the chickens were there, you know, that, 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 that people were around, were also reacting to the music. You could see people dancing. You heard stories from the people who were teaching you the music. And the difficulty of arriving, it wasn't served up in a way that was already refined for the purpose of me digesting it. It was being transmitted by a person who themselves had already been come over to the States, spent time here, and so could transmit it to me in a way that was what was very smooth. So those points of tension were places that I had to work out myself. And they were sometimes very uncomfortable and sometimes very alienating, but they were always full of life because getting past those those points, even even if they were points that could be navigated in some other way very easily. Say so it's like we were discussing before this, you know, AI, which allow, allows all kinds of things to happen very smoothly without tension. But it's those points of tension that make learning so gratifying because you actually have to climb a mountain to get over them. And then when you've done that, you've learned so much more than you would have if you could have just driven right through the tunnel you know, that went through the mountain. But getting over the mountain is itself a kind of artistic victory, I guess, if you're, if you're, if you're an artist and you're trying to learn, because ultimately we're trying to learn something about ourselves. And when you talked about ego, one can call it ego, one can call it self-expression, but you want it to be the most direct that it can be. And I think we have to challenge ourselves to get there in whatever way. For me, that challenge was really that if I loved a type of music and wanted to get more into it, I wanted to try to find some of it in distilled form. And that often involved going to places and sometimes arduous journeys to get there. But once I was there, I had had all these tensions, the conflict of communication and of trying to draw out what all those narratives that I was being introduced to would mean to me, an American. And when you go to a place like Ghana, for example, I know you also went to Bulgaria too, right? Yeah, to Bulgaria. To study like Bulgarian rhythmic stuff going on, right? Through the clarinet. Is that right? Is yeah. it always through the... So by the way, for people listening, like you also are, you know, a very uh, proficient, at the, to say the very least, <laughs> clarinet player. So everything that you... I'm, I'm assuming everything that you're listening to kind of goes through the lens of that instrument as well. Am I, am I right in saying that? Or is that kind of, <laughs> a kind of too general? You know, I was, I played clarinet since I was about seven. So I certainly regard it as an important part of my life. When I realized I wanted to compose, then I, I kept doing the clarinet, but I, I took it a little less seriously, um, you know, a pedagogical kind of thing. And I, I, I was really concentrating on getting my compositional understanding as, as, as having that as primary. But also, I was playing jazz piano, I mean, in high school at the same time, and I was playing in a lot of groups, and I was playing rock bands and stuff like that. I certainly have an orientation that is melodic toward the clarinet, and it's definitely my best instrument by far. So it's, it's one where, where I feel like I can get deeper into something by, by playing it. And so certainly the Bulgarian music was, it was just really because I was drawn to Bulgarian music in general. I love the rhythms and the sound of it and the harmonies. But I, but yeah, since I had that ability, I thought it would be a great way just to, just to go there and say to some great player, you know, here I am, I want to learn. And, and so that's what I did. But I, I suppose I also have an orientation that's partly pianistic and also partly comes out of playing a lot of jazz too. So, so I often think in terms of chord structures as well. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of jazz too, I mean, you, you worked with the, uh, the jazz band over at Lincoln Center uh, kind of recently, the last a few years. So I want to play a couple minutes from this excerpt, this really great piece called the Migration Series.
So like this piece here also shows another other side of you, you know, versus the Jack Quartet intonations piece. Now this one is like, you know, you have this huge, like, I can't even imagine how many people are on stage here. And you got this huge wall of sound coming at you, completely different than the kind of like intimate setting you have with the quartet. So I'm wondering how did, how did this all come about? Because it seems like a completely different aesthetic project, vision, than what you wrote for the Jack Quartet. This came about because Wynton Marsalis asked me to write a work for his band, the, the Lincoln Center Jazz Band Orchestra, and the American Composers Orchestra. When I had this residency with the ACO, which was a three-year residency from the League of Orchestras, I was at this orchestra in residence for three years, so I proposed doing this collaboration with them. and. They said, yeah, great. Then I had a tricky job, which was to reconcile the way jazz band players are used to playing with the way orchestral musicians are playing. And that brought up a few problems. One being the fact that, you know, orchestra players are used to really reading all kinds of very complex charts with, you know, very specific notations, contemporary music kinds of traditions and you know people in who play in in jazz bands not as much and so you know they're used to reading down charts yeah but not quite with the same level of specificity at the same time jazz players can swing and they understand all the different types of swing orchestra musicians not so much i mean maybe a few of the brass players and possibly a percussionist or two but once you get outside of that it's much less nuanced also another thing is that well of course the jazz players could improvise and that's that's one of their strong suits and orchestral players aren't very comfortable improvising or not unless it's a very structured kind of way and then of course I think the biggest thing to reconcile was the fact that in the jazz band in order to orient themselves in time and space and rhythm they listen for the rhythm section which is behind them so they use these the ears and their orientation is back Orchestral players, by contrast, use their eyes. They watch a conductor who's in front of them. So if you think about something that could possibly splinter some type of group, big group of people on stage, 100 people on stage, it would be that, the fact that half of them are listening behind them and the other half are looking in front of them for the rhythm. So how do you reconcile those things? So that was something that I had to reckon with. And that was one of the big challenges. I think one of the things that you have to do as an artist is solve problems. Sometimes we create problems just for ourselves to solve, you know, that's It sounds like you created the problem because you were the one that wanted to work with the jazz band. (laughs) That's it. That's that's it. I mean, we do create problems. I mean, we create, maybe that's the anxiety of it all is that we, we, we create problems that we have to solve as artists. And Out of that, hopefully, something deeper comes, which is some kind of reconciliation, some kind of solution. The audience doesn't necessarily need to know what that work is as long as it's successful at the end. As long as you've solved the problem, they hear the result of that, which is hopefully something maybe that was never there before. I mean, the timing issue you're talking about, is that something that you knew going into it? Or something that was discussed, or was that something that you were listening to the rehearsals and you're like, shit, <laughs> the timing is off. Is there something I need to do to fix it? I wonder wh- which one was it, or was it some combination maybe of both? It's a struggle. I mean, you're always learning. Some of it, Some look, I had played in jazz bands. I understood the way one thinks when one is playing in a jazz band, and I had to constantly put myself back in that space. But that didn't mean that I didn't write some really hard stuff for the jazz band. I mean, I think it's an incredibly hard part. And when we were recording it with the kids from Juilliard and, you know, it it was a stretch for everybody. But I think that's, you know, that's, I don't think musicians mind stretching. It's just like with the, the, that Jack Quartet piece, you know, intonations, you know, it's an incredibly difficult difficult piece. And when you hear it, you think, well, probably only the Jack Quartet can play this. But since they've done it, at least five other quartets have done that, maybe more. And I can't believe that because when I wrote it, I thought only they will ever play this. Mm-hmm. But what happens is that when musicians hear and understand your reason for asking them to do something difficult, they respond not just to how difficult it is, but to the justification they if they feel it's justified if they hear that it's justified 
if they sense that it's justified, they will do the work to get there. If they don't feel it's justified, they probably won't do the work. So that's, that's really an inner kind of thing. And so I don't feel that we should shy away from writing difficult things as long as they're, they feel necessary for the expression of what we're trying to convey. I mean, it's difficult when you're talking about orchestra, right? Because we're talking about orchestra now, because it's not just that they have to feel like they're, <laughs> they are going to get something back from playing this difficult music. You have to convince them rather quickly because you don't have like a month to figure this out. You have like, in my case, I had 66 minutes <laughs> a few weeks ago with the LA Phil. I, but I have to convince them not by the 66 minute. I got to convince them by minute five, you know, that the stuff that they're seeing there is worth playing. And I'm not sure if I was 100, to be honest, I wasn't, I'm not sure if I was 100% successful, you know, in conveying that, you know. Well, I hope so, you weren't 100% successful. Well, that's the thing. Then that would almost be a failure in itself because cause you want to kind of always be failing at least a little so that you learn, you know, because you want to be trying things. Yeah. You don't just want to be doing what you already know works and that kind of thing. You know, you throw something in there and say, well, if I try this, I wonder what will happen. But I like what you said about rhythm because, like, that's something I personally struggle. And I think a lot of composers struggle with rhythm, actually. With I don't the think, orchestra, you mean? With just the in general, uh. I think, personally, because I think was we're trained from, especially in Western, I'm talking about Western music, we're trained so much to, to learn the four-part harmony, you know, four-part chorales, we're trained to do the sight singing, you know, uh, we're trained uh, to play the, the piano and uh, like, and it's usually like canonical things that don't have very complex rhythmical things going on. So that when we get to doing contemporary classical music and then going one step further, incorporating other traditions, that tension of writing those rhythms down and then that tension of, okay, we wrote those rhythms down, but how does it sound in this huge acoustical space with all these people playing? Then that's where, at least for me, that's where the tension is. And that's, that's the tension actually more so than anything else in that piece that I wrote, uh, that I had. It's like, how do I reconcile those rhythmic things that I want to hear in such a huge orchestral hall with players that are not used to playing those type of rhythms? So I think what you did with the jazz band, because you had a lot of these rhythms in the jazz band, the, the string players especially, not to call out the strength players, but I mean, they're the ones that kind of have to figure out how to lock in to those rhythms that you're writing. And, and I don't know if that's the experience that you had. I'm just kind of hypothesizing that's what the experience that you might have had when you were listening in on those rehearsals. I mean, the Western tradition is weak in rhythm. It's the, it's the area where we're weak. Like, I think we, we just have to admit it and yeah. put it out there and say, Rhythm in the Western classical tradition is not our strong suit. Every musical tradition, every cultural tradition of art in general, you know, has its strong and, and weaker points. And I would say, um, but, and that's what makes it so rich to study other traditions, because then you come in contact with, so you say, hey, this is powerful, you know. You will find every aspect of every tradition powerful, you know, every tradition that, accentuate certain things which makes it more interesting in that realm and i mean think about you know carnotic music or something like the, the rhythms and the and the uh you know the power of the melodic line in that and the tahai and all this i would say that having studied a lot of traditions firsthand that where rhythm is so central like brazilian music or bulgarian music or or, or west african music you know it's not our strong suit our strong suit is harmony could be melody to a certain extent, you know, but, but I would say, you know, harmony is, is, and form is where a certain type of form is where Western music has made incredible strides. And I think it's something to celebrate and to, to, to learn about. I think it's what draws other people to what we do, possibly timbre as well. You know, it's certain, certain types of timbres, you know, maybe those are, are the three things, let's say, and, and, and possibly the strongest being harmony, form, and in a way, harmony is kind of part of form and orchestration, but rhythm, it ain't. So it's really that tension that arrives when we try to incorporate rhythmic tropes and rhythmic systems from other cultures is a big challenge in Western music. And it's where all the tension lies, or a lot of the tension lies, um, in these kinds of transformations. And composition is a lot about transformation. I mean, nothing's completely original. Um, and, and, and so we, we, we all are taking something from somewhere as our, as, as our elements 
to use in in the work that we do. But it's those transformations that are that are where those tensions happen, and and those those transformations can be you know rhythm is it, it's it's ineffable, but it's also so specific. You know, um, it's something that's so hard to describe because certain rhythms, like the rhythm of the samba. Are, are so hard to describe. You can't describe them in notation. You know, notation is insufficient. And in Bulgaria, I had these these kinds of uh, tensions where I was hearing rhythms reductively because of thinking of it in a Western context. I, I thought reductively, so I was I was dividing time, and they were thinking additively. So they thought, oh, well, this is just a slightly longer beat. It's just another beat, but it's a little bit longer. We don't think that way in Western music. We are dividing up time discreetly. Unless you're we... Messian or someone like that. What? Yeah. Unless you're like Messian or Messian. But even <laughs> Messian, I mean, yeah. he he would, you know, he he put a dot on that. Right. You know, it was, and 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 he still it still added up to the same amount in his world, uh, you know, on the page. But for these musicians, the time it it, it flows differently, and they think of a beat as a as almost a, a thing in itself. So getting into that way of thinking, that's what's so hard. It's, it, and it causes, I mean, it caused me to have arguments. My teacher stopped talking to me for a couple really? of days because he was so angry <laughs> that I was writing the music down in a certain way. I was, I was, I was, because, because I was thinking reductively, not holistically, about the lengths of notes and the, the mathematical. I was being mathematical and reductive about it. Was he upset that you were writing things down in general or what you wrote down? He was upset that I was notating the music in a way that he would not notate it. You know, I was putting meters to it that he wouldn't. I, I, I wrote that something was, was in 15. And he said, it's not in 15, it's in 7. And I said, well, it can't really be in 7 because, see, it, it has an extra long beat on the end. And he said, it's in 7. It just has an extra long beat at the end. Whoa. <laughs> and, I, and I said, but that extra long beat is actually, that equates to 3 of the shorter beat. That's why I made it into a 15. In other words, what he was saying is it's just a long seven or 14, you know, exactly. Uh, But, but, but he would not accept that, that, and, and, and eventually we, we had this argument and he said, but you know, you're, you're hearing the music. That's, that's how you're notating it for yourself. But our music is for us. Like we don't make our music for you to notate it. We make our music for us. And so I want you to notate it as we notate it. That was interesting to me. Of, of course, I was dealing with something which is interesting, which is a tradition that is partially notated, right? Because we have some, some traditions that are folk traditions that are completely unnotated. And then there are other traditions that are partially notated. And then there are fully classical traditions that are also unnotated or partially notated, you know? Um, in China or in Korea. Yeah, I had, Korea, a, I, I had a guest, Cheng Jin Ko, who was talking about this very thing. Because in Chinese music, they, they have a full notation system. Sure. I mean, you look at it, you, you can't make heads or tails about it if you're not from that culture. But it, it's, a, it's a full tradition that's completely separate from the Western classical tradition. And it's separate. The amazing thing is that it's also partially separate from their folk tradition. Mm-hmm. See, because it's a classical tradition. Like we talk about classical music, yeah, it's a classical tradition. They have a classical tradition. You know, Carnatic music has a classical tradition. Other classical traditions, there are. I mean, I I don't know as much about Arabic music, and you know a lot more than I do, and 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 so you would know like whether there are classical traditions that are separate from the um, from a tradition that's more like people who play, you know, just play their instrument in groups or on the street or for events. Although, I mean, in Arabic music, at least those things kind of intermingle anyway over many hundreds, uh, hundreds of years. Just like they do here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You also took from another tradition, too. You took some Portuguese poetry and made it into this orchestral piece with this uh, really like individual kind of singer. I mean, this singer is not singing in a traditional bel canto style. So I want to hear a couple of minutes of this with you.
we're talking about harmony. The harmony is like this completely, basically, Western functional based harmony. I mean, there's no, you don't make, you don't try to hide that. But then the voice is is not your operatic voice. So like, how did you, was that a decision you made earlier on that you were going to do that? Or was that something that happened along the way? I'm just curious because it's a very different approach, I think, than the migration series and the intonations piece for Jack. Well, you know, I wrote that for Luciana Souza, who's a Brazilian singer who came out of jazz and Brazilian music, samba, Bossa Nova, and she lives in LA, but she's also a composer and a wonderful, wonderful musician. So I was really writing for Luciana's voice, and, and she told me right off the bat, she said, look, I have a small voice, a small range, I always use a microphone, you know, I could do certain things with my voice, but just, just be aware that it, it's not a big operatic voice. So yeah, I, I think I can see, it's not that it couldn't be sung by an opera singer, but I, I perceived it more as being sung by a voice that was more used to singing in vernacular traditions. Mm-hmm. And, and she, of course, she, she sang a lot of jazz and, and is amazing doing kind of scat stuff too. So she has that ability, but you know, I wrote for her voice. And when you write for a singer, maybe even more than a particular instrumentalist, I mean, you're really writing for a very specific sound when you write for a specific singer. So that molds the piece in certain ways, uh, maybe in some ways that that really dictate who would choose to sing it in the future. But I could imagine someone singing in a very different way. But it helps the piece find its form. And in this case, I was working with text of Eugenio de Andrade, who's a Portuguese poet who wrote a lot of poetry that was used in fado. You know, the fado music, it's like their music, like flamenco. It's it's their, their typical kind of traditional music. And so, Luciana, there was a little bit of a tension there because Luciana is Brazilian. Brazil, Brazil, they speak Portuguese and they are used to fado, but she's not a fado singer. So these texts, which are very, very kind of evocative, very sensual, but also dictate the form of the music. The music was was led by the poetry. But like, how does that relate to, I guess, the orchestral backdrop? Like, how did you decide? Because the language is very different, I would say, than the other two pieces. I think like the like especially the jack piece because the harmonies like you know you're using microtones and the a, a lot of times you have these very dense harmonies but then this one you have like you know you have straight up major chords you know minor chord things like that you know that an audience in yeah. an or- of course you're writing for the LA Chamber Orchestra so there might be the Mozart Symphony right after your piece for the Haydn Symphony so I, is that something at least for me I definitely take those things into consideration like what else is on the program but I wonder is that is that why you made that decision or is it something else that has to do more with the fado for example maybe that I don't know I think that some of it is is because when I write for a particular group like the Jack or I write for a particular soloist like Luciana or someone like Winton, they bring up, they evoke certain things in your mind. You choose to write for them because of that because something vivid comes up in your mind when you think of these musicians because it's really, it's a collaboration. It's very intimate and that's why I love writing for musicians that I that I know or that I admire in some way because there's something very very intimate and powerful about that. And I think that, you know, I just went with what I felt when thinking about Luciana and her voice and what would work for that. But of course, you know, I also come from a very lyrical tradition. I played a lot of jazz. I love songs. I used to sing a lot and I sang in bands. And so I also come from a tradition of songwriting and, you know, I've been working on opera and musical theater over the years. So, so I think I, I, I love a good tune yeah, absolutely. sometimes. And, yeah. and, and, and I don't think that that's, that has to be completely separate from all the other things. And in some ways, you know, yeah, different pieces may sound different. And I don't think it's up to me to control that. I think it's up to me that all these things can be as much me as, as I can put into them. And I'll leave it to other people, you know, someday after I'm dead <laughs> to decide <laughs> why they all belong together or if they do or don't, uh, or which ones are more me than other ones. But for now, I'm just putting music out there. And, and I suppose the result of that or, or, or how that adds up to a language or an identity is less important for me to decide that because I don't think I get to decide that anyway. I think the people who decide that are the people who decide to carry your music forward 
or not. I mean, I think the big thing across at least these three pieces that we're listening to today is that you, once you establish a language there, you stick within that world. You don't say, okay, I'm going to use something else from another piece in this, which I tend to do. <laughs> I feel like my pieces, at least they all kind of start and end. And they're kind of like this one big piece that kind of goes on and on and on, at least for the last few years. But with yours, it's, I, that's what I like about it. They're singular in themselves. I don't need, you know, five pieces of context to hear this piece. Whereas if I'm he hearing late Beethoven string quartets, for example, in my feeling, you need context before like appreciating that music. But like with your music, I like it because it's like I can get into that world. I don't need to hear the other five, six pieces that came before it. And actually, if I heard the five, six pieces that came before it, I don't think it would help understand that singular piece. But then I'm also glad that there are these five different things that come right after each other because they're all equally strong. That's something I can't think kind of lost right now, at least my generation of composers. The model is more like probably what I'm doing, where it's like a chapter, one chapter after another. One person I can think of off the top of my head, because I just saw him a few weeks ago, is Andrew Norman. I feel like, you know, I have, he has like one piece that comes right after another and they kind of all are this one big piece, but you don't necessarily do that. So that's like kind of like something I feel like our generation doesn't do as much, but I'm not sure I could be just generalizing as usual. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe Andrew sits in between my generation and your generation <laughs> somewhere. He might be... I think he's kind of like, yeah, I think so too. And probably right Chris, in the middle. Probably right? like Chris Saron too is probably in that same boat. Probably, right? yeah. Because Chris is another person. the same age. That does that too. You know, one piece ends and the next piece kind of starts in, in, in a way. A composer that I always admired when I was coming up was Gergi Ligeti because I always felt that each piece had a reason for existing in itself. Like he was trying to solve some problem in each piece. And I always found that to be a very inspiring way to get excited about a piece. It, it felt like it motivated me to write each piece, to have this kind of problem that I was solving, to have some kind of tension that I was resolving or exploring. You never know if you're resolving it until it's done and even then maybe you didn't resolve it but at least if you can explore it and go deeper into it that was certainly my motivation it's impossible to know how your work is perceived or who gets excited about it even because sometimes you know there are people who you feel you have something in common with language wise maybe for me it would be somebody you know i was very influenced by thelonious monk say harmonically uh, so if it was somebody who had that same kind of harmonic inclination, you know, I might think this person will dig what I do, but not necessarily. Those surface details don't, aren't really what makes people get excited about what you do. It's something internal. And so that means you can't really predict who's going to find what you do compelling. They may have a completely different language than you. And so I think it's up to those people to, to figure out w whether it has the kind of depth that makes it important to be heard. In the end, it's up to performers to decide, you know, what they want to carry forward. And, and you may be right that there may be some generational reasons for those shifts. There's a lot of tendency in, you know, to want to talk about identity, one's own identity, and to explore that. And maybe that is, that maybe that plays into the tendency now to, to really kind of have a unified sphere of exploration. Yeah, I don't know if it has anything to do with, if I'm even going further, the idea of capitalism or individualism, because, you know, this whole thing about marketing, branding, that kind of thing, you can't say, I, in my opinion, you can't say that word identity without saying the other words, especially branding. in this country, because that's how, if you look outside of music, everything else is kind of positioned that way, you know, like uh, I have a, you know, I have a cousin that has a, I'll give you an example in a capitalistic way, I have a cousin that has a social media company, but they started out doing all sorts of stuff, alcohol, hookah, food. They did a, they even did like a political campaign. They did all sorts of stuff, but at some point they had to have an identity, right? So now all they do is food, right? right? And, and nothing else, right? They do coffee, they do chips, they do uh, all sorts of stuff, but just that they won't do anything else, even though they can do the other things, right? So I, in a, in a way, not to position myself that way, but you, I feel like at least a discussion has to be had in some way that yes, Maybe I could do the other things, but I choose to do this one thing because I'm just very interested in it or, or maybe just because the opportunities are coming 
because of it. And I have to reconcile, am I doing it for the right reasons? You know, am I actually interested in it or am I just doing it for the opportunity? Right. So that's something that we as artists, because we're, we're, we're working outside the capitalist mindset, right? But we are also in the capitalist system, especially here in America. So it's just something that we have to think about. I think you cannot ignore it, right? It's Maybe I just opened no, a big can of worms at the no, end of the show. <laughs> Hey, you know, I think it's, you know, it's very much a part of our lives. We, we have to somehow pay the rent (laughs) every month. It's difficult. (laughs) And we also, you know, we have to live in the real world. So, and, and that's a tension in itself as Mm -hmm. an artist. Well, great. Let's leave it at that. (laughs) The the whole show is about tension. Exactly. I appreciate that. Thanks for coming on.